and I thought I'd go down to you know the surf club where I was a, a member, and um, it was just one of those things. Big after a big surf, found a rock under the water, and um, anyone that's been in a position of being knocked out in the water knows. Uh, well, I wasn't knocked out, which was good, but you know, having mm. a spinal cord injury where you go direct to pa uh, paralysis, I was face down, and uh, luckily, um, you know, I was a uh, you know sort of on an elite pathway uh, uh, athlete-wise. Had enough breath to keep me going for a while until I was very lucky. Somebody, not only uh, two people, uh, in fact, um, uh, saw me in the water. Um, one knew uh, what to do with the spinal, um, possible spinal injury. They were a professional lifeguard by uh, trade, but it had actually broken their neck only uh, uh, about 12 months before, but walked out of it. Right. Flipped me over and uh, luckily I hadn't drowned or anything. So in a split second, I went from, you know, 100% to pretty much zero for, uh, you know, for uh, the next six months in a, spinal unit back in the day and uh, my first helicopter flight which uh, wasn't as cool as I was expecting <laughs> it to be yeah um, and then uh, you know uh, the the long the long path back for somebody with a high level spinal cord injury so uh, when you say uh, back trying in trying to the... regain some sort of independence when you say back in the day where, where what are we talking so, where, so that's where... 19, 1983 yeah so when you say um, I, I mean there's obviously a lot more knowledge around disability and accidents. And I think everybody would, you know, in some way would kind of know what to do with a spinal cord injury these days. Back then, was it common knowledge? Like, was that, was, it, was that a real rarity that that guy knew what to do? Um, it, it, in a, in, in, you know, in a surf life saving sense, you get trained for all sorts of, um, you know, emergencies uh, in the, in the surf, obviously. And, um, you know, Water-based injuries are still pretty high up there. I mean, you, you know, cars, uh, motor vehicle accidents, and then, you know, um, the average age of uh, somebody with a spinal cord injury is between 16 and uh, 25 or 26 or so, predominantly male. I think it's 80% male, 20% female. Is it? Um, and I've heard you yeah. say every, every now and then that, you know, you do some pretty stupid things and then afterwards think about, uh, how dangerous they were. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that's pretty normal for you know that A-type male of uh, of those age groups. But yeah, the the care things really changed over the years. So, um, I, from what I understand, I attended uh, the International Spinal Cord Injuries um, uh, Medical uh, Conference a few years ago in Sydney. Um, they're getting a lot better recovery from people because of the protocols they're using and some uh, new treatments. So look, that's terrific. Um, but you know, generally spinal cord injury is not a good lifestyle choice. Yeah. Mm. Uh, before we get into your recovery and your life afterwards, I do have to ask because you're an expert in disability and inclusion now, which I love and you advocate very hard, but when you were an 18 year old Shaka surfer uh, up on your feet, what did you know about disability? Did you have any idea about anything? Look, of course, I, I suppose because of rugby circles, you're aware of spinal cord injury. I mean, they, um, you know, it was only a few years after my injury they really started to change scrum laws. But I think at that stage, uh, one season in New Zealand, there was like 15 quadriplegics in a year. Really? Uh, something crazy like that. So, so the rugby community were really aware of needing to reduce those injuries. And actually, only uh, you know, only two years ago, there was a spate of four injuries just up in Queensland uh, uh, early on in um, in a season. So, um, uh, you know, I, I had some awareness of disability because I was you know in the middle of a uh, PE education degree. You know, we we'd done some study on disability stuff. I'd uh, been involved in uh, you know been involved in doing some uh sessions at what was then the Cumberland College for educate uh for education where they specialized in um all sorts of uh programs that got uh people with disability involved in sport as well and then come across some athletes with um 
disability. Um, but yeah, no, generally uh, I was as ignorant as everybody else. Mm. So those couple of minutes or minute or however long it was probably felt like an eternity with your face down in the water, um, not being able to move your body. Oh, that gives me shivers thinking about it. It's such a surf is such an, a traumatic place for that to happen because there's a lot of, I, I was a lifeguard for a lot of years. My mates are professional iron men. And so part of that is they have to get time in the sand as part of their um, program. And they see more often than we are aware, people diving into shallow water and hitting sandbanks and becoming paraplegics, quadriplegics, etc. cetera. Um, but it's the real fear around drowning in that moment because you're unable, you've gone from being able to swim, yeah, kick, take care yep. of yourself, stand. Can you, do you remember, even though it was so long ago, do you remember those minutes of being face down and, and. Oh, uh, every second. Um, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, it's because I was, I was lucky and I, it was funny and, and I played, you know, basketball, rugby league, soccer, AFL. Uh, I played all sorts of sports and I'd been very lucky in that time never to have knocked myself out. So I must just have a bloody hard head. Hmm. But when I, you know, I, I was conscious of just, trying to you know hold my breath as long as I could um and you know I knew the consequences of not you know if if I did drown and then the possibilities of uh you know acquired acquired brain injury coming out of uh, lack of oxygen going to the brain so um yeah it's one of those things but I'd always been a I still am a very calm person that doesn't get panicked that often um and panic's the thing that really kills people in water yeah. um so uh you know if uh and for all those people listening you know learn to swim that'd be a first one <laughs> and then the other one is try not to panic because panic's one of the real killers in the water i think another big learning as well i was shocked when i started playing sport how many people were from an accident from diving in water like i was shocked it's actually a bigger number than you think. Do you reckon there is enough, I guess, education pieces around that, for, especially for young, young kids in school? Well, look, I, I, th I think there's, you know, so many, um, so many different situations where um, even, you know, even areas, you take the beach, the, 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 the way, the, 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 the forces of the ocean are so incredibly powerful that just from one day to another, the, um, you know, the, the, the banks can change, what was there yesterday wasn't, rocks are uncovered. And similarly, um, you know, there's a lot of injuries that are actually not beach injuries, but they're uh, inland in rivers and mm -hmm. uh, water holes and other things mm. where you know, it all looks cool, but you know, unless you really know what's under the water each time, um, and, you know, there was somebody like me that was, you know, actually trained at that beach and, uh, you know, people say it's a one in a million, uh, but, you know, it happened and uh, it happened, it does happen on a regular basis. So, you know, as I said, I don't have the stats at hand, but, you know, motor accidents are still a major cause mm -hmm. and water injuries are, um, you know, they're up there as well. Here's an idea too, it's not cool diving in water, just walk in. It's in a, it's interesting as well. Just, I know you make it a joke about that, but something I'm needs serious. just, just walk in. Yeah. What something needs to change in your life or you need to have a moment where you understand the repercussions of actions. Mm -hmm. um, for me, you know, I played um, AFL up in uh, Caloundra on the sunshine coast and we were a very tight team. We won a premiership together. And um, about four years later, about, so maybe like five, six years ago, I heard about the tragic passing of one of my teammates and uh, he had dived into a water hole in Queensland. Uh, one that he dived into many times, but things had changed in the water and he passed away. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it, up until that point, I was the guy who jumped off things. Yeah, I, There's a place down where I grew up, Bird Rock in, in Janjuk, and, and there's a little, you know, stone that's out of the water and it's got a little water hole and used to jump off it all the time in summer. Now I look at kids doing that. And I'm like, geez, I do it. you know, because yeah. the tides change, things change. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And yeah. same, you know, same here. Uh, Lane Cove River wasn't far from the where I went to school, and you know you'd uh, bunk off, hit the river, and uh, there were some rocks to jump off uh, into the water all the time. Mm. As I found out later, um, 
uh, maybe the rocks weren't as dangerous as the pollution that was in the river. <laughs> <laughs> so when you had your accident, I mean, you're a real positive guy now and you've used your disability for good. Were you always like that from the get-go or did you go through a tough time straight off? in? Uh, uh, yeah, of course I went through a tough time. You, you know, 19, you think the world's, you know, everything's in front of you, everything's possible. You're 10 foot tall, you're bulletproof. Um, and then you're not. And so, you know, I, I, I talk in an academic sense about, you know, really living in two worlds where, um, you know, I come from this, you know, reasonably, um, you know, privileged, able-bodied background. Well, you, you do, you take a lot of, lot of things for granted. And even though you're the same person, you are different and you are different because, you know, almost everything you've got to do. And going back then, it was, you know, so much worse than it is now with just basic access requirements without getting into, uh, you know, ICT tech and, and, and all that space. Um, but, you know, I, I not long, uh, actually, I think it was just out of hospital. One of the um, uh, one of the girls I used to go and see, you know, lots of bands with, Said, oh, uh, and yeah, this is cringeable. Uh, now, uh, went and saw Style Council at the Horton Pavilion. <laughs> uh, you know, 1984 and 1985. And this is the last that's sort of been on the short side. And I'm, you know, six, three ish. And uh, so a lot of the times when we used to see Ben, she'd end up on my shoulders. And, mm-hmm. um, and so everything was cruising along and we had good seats up the front. The security were doing the right thing. And then Rob Weller come, you know, gets on the mic and says, I want everybody up the front dancing. And, you know, oh. that was the last thing I saw of the show. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, the, the first of many inverted commas, um, you know, letters of complaint that I wrote to venues. And uh, actually, if you go to Horton Pavilion, you can still see sort of the outcome of uh, that first early complaint where there's a number of, and now it's not perfect access, but they have a number of raised platforms for um, wheelies or people that aren't as good on their feet, uh, where at least uh, you know they'll have you know you've got sight lines, um, and yeah, it was that it was that sort of stuff that then drove me mm. uh, after doing an undergraduate degree to go into sort of the environmental planning area, um, and that's been a really good foundation for not just raising awareness, but you know making sure the technicalities that are local, uh, regional, national um, amplify rather than, as you'll understand, Dylan, dealing with things on a case-by-case level, which is just infuriating because literally, you know, the same form of discrimination can happen next door the next day uh, after addressing it in another place. And so... Mm. Um, you know, I've gone from being a really, uh, you know, angry crip, you know, um, putting uh, putting a mark down the side of cars, illegally parked in wheelie, wheelchair spaces, Good man. to being uh, far more strategic and uh, looking at the long game of uh, making sure that the improvements are, stri- are strategic, engaged, and also um, that there's a dialogue with those who oppose and and there's some terrible stuff goes on uh you know for example in the uh, review of the access to premises standards where uh you know part of the hospitality and hotel community were trying to remove um, the proportion of accessible rooms uh, which you know they say uh, the current rooms aren't used to the occupancy that's required but they don't understand the complexity of it why would i stay in any in a one of their rooms that is designated as, you know, a, a disabled room or an accessible room, if that room is actually a crap room that's yeah, exactly. got no view and lousy access, you get downgraded. So when I go as a motivational speaker, the client pays for it and they pay for a better room. But then I get there and I get downgraded. Oh, I've only got all the disabled rooms are actually on the bottom floor with no windows. And I was like, well, I think he's a view of an air. Can I have the good room? And they're like, yeah, but it's not accessible. So you get the crap on. You're like, well, that sucks. Mm. I also probably stuffed up that for you, Simon, with the venues, um, with the elevated platforms at the Horton, because I crowd surfed in my wheelchair and then probably got booted out as well. (laughs) I I couldn't see shit either, mate. I'm with you. But no, but that's an interesting one with the rooms. Yeah, I'm the same where, uh, you know, but I travel with an attendant as well. 
so the attendant always ends up with a better room than I do. Yeah, my brother gets a good room sometimes when we go somewhere, and I'm in a crap one. I go, that's not cool. Yeah, you get to visit their room to see what the view's like. Exactly right, yes. Have the other half. So, so somewhere like Sydney Harbour, and it's got a lot better now, but uh, back in you know, the late 90s when we first did some auditing of rooms, there was only four accessible rooms in Sydney that had a view of the, in, in the Sydney CBD that had a view of the harbour. Um, and, How uh, many rooms whole, would there be, do you think, that would have uh, a view? Uh, look, it's got a, it's got a lot it's got a lot better now. So, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll give them a plug because, you know, you want to give the good ones a plug. The new Sofitel down at Darling Harbour, it's got an accessible room on every floor um, and it's got, you know, great views, great room and they've done a really good job. But try and find it on their website, you know. Yeah, true. So uh, even the places that have got it and I look, I I did my first report in that space back in 95 for... Um, Tourism New South Wales and work with a really good uh, mate of mine who uh, put out the first uh, guide to uh, accessible travel in uh, in the country, a guy called Bruce Cameron, a uh, book called Easy Access Australia, and it's still worth looking at these days because what he did, it's not about the hotels, it's about the experiences that you can have. So, um, you know, whether you're somebody with a mobility disability or somebody who's blind or vision impaired or deaf or hearing impaired when you go to a destination you want to know what the cool things are that you can do there mm-hmm. you know you don't want to know how good the hotel is nobody's going to stay in a hotel unless it's an amazing hotel so um you know the working with destination marketing authorities who have got big budgets and you know i always say follow the money with this stuff if they if they can't tell you uh, you know, what the budget is for marketing for, you know, accessible tourism, you know, they're doing sweet FA. Yeah. yeah. Um, and everyone who's listening to this podcast, maybe for the first time to hear Simon's story that we did an episode with a lady named Julie Jones, uh, who has a blog called Travel Without Limits. And she covers a lot of the accessibility places that she's seen with her son, who's high level care in a wheelchair. Um, for you, Simon, can we talk about the difference in generational disability that mm, you've witnessed? Good one. 80s, 90s, noughties, now in 2020 and beyond. Um, you've kind of been able to witness the rise of technology. Uh, can you take us through some of the biggest moments in your life where you've seen some of these implemented? Reason being, Simon, because I always say in the media, I'm very lucky to be born when I am because I think of stories of the past, language, accessibility, and but I don't know, you know what I mean? We, I, I haven't really spoken to anybody from your generation around it. Ah, yeah, it is. Uh, you, you wake up one day and you look in the mirror and you go, How'd that happen? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to paint you as old as well. <laughs> when I said 80s, 90s, 90s, I'm like, Okay, I'm really kind of giving Simon's age. Oh, yeah. that's funny. Um, and, and similarly, I pay homage to, um, uh, you know, the extraordinary group of advocates, uh, you know, for example, in the um. In the 1970s, uh, many people don't understand that the reason the uh, in New South Wales was the first place to introduce the uh, um, the taxi subsidy scheme for wheelchair users and introduce you know wheelchair accessible taxis etc. is because a whole bunch of bloody agro wheelies uh, chained themselves to the front of the different really? uh, eastern suburbs railway stations. No they, were in, uh, they were putting in a new lot of railway stations that weren't accessible at all. Um, and it was embarrassing for the government. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. people um, uh, people like, you know, Joan Hume and uh, John Moxon and um, Kevin Byrne. Now, you know, these, uh, John won't like me saying it, he's, he's still alive and kicking. But, you know, people like that need a tremendous homage paid for um, you know, what I, you know, direct action, uh, direct action advocacy uh, politics with mm-hmm. organizations like, you know, Paraquad and Blind Citizens and uh, Spinal Cord Injuries Australia and, uh, you know, other groups like Shush for the Deaf, et cetera, that, you know, you had to get aggro and you had to get organized. And, you know, organisations that came into being like Physical Disability Council, which was, you know, and I'll be colloquial here, you know, a bunch of crips that set up an organisation that was uh, all 
the, the board was all people with disability with one position left for a, a person that say, um, you know, um, a, a parent of a child with a disability um, because, you know, you had to make a noise. Otherwise you were overlooked, other than omitted. Um, and then they'd say, oh, you know, that's bad luck because if we have to do a refurb on it, that's the terrible cost of disability. Well, it's not. If you design uh, on, you know, universal principles from the same, it's, uh, you know, about a 0.5%, uh, uh, you know, 0.5% difference on top. And places that like Westfield shopping centres, do it beautifully, but they don't do it well. They they may do it beautifully, partly for disability, but they're doing it for bloody shopping trolleys, you know. Yeah. Um, if, uh, so, if you're listening from Westfield and want to sponsor the podcast, please get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, um, it, it's inter interesting. I, I think Frank Lowy. I'm not sure whether he's uh, listens to you, but that'd be wonderful. Yeah. That'd be nice. <laughs> can I can I ask something about that? And it's I just want your opinion. In order to get heard, disability, people with disability, especially previously pre-social media, that, as you said, had to get loud and aggro. Do you think that sometimes has had a negative effect on the community because people, able-bodied people go, oh, God, all disabled people do is yell and complain. So they're going to well, put no, it in no, a okay. basket. Okay, let me, let me um, moderate those comments. So, oh, no, because I'm with you. No, 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 no. Yeah. An organisation like Physical Disability Council, um, they, you know, they, we, I was on the board for three years there. Um, it was a, it was what's called an evidence-based policy driver. So sure, um, you know, for, uh, and look at, look it up, Dylan, there was a young lady called Scarlett Finney, mm -hmm. took a federal court action as an eight-year-old, obviously with the support of her parents, because she wanted to go to the school where her friends were going to go. Yep. Um, and you know the, uh, the the access related stuff, and she had a you know a reasonably um, you know uh, reasonably mild uh, disability when it came to mobility, etc. Uh, um, the terrible vitriol that that poor kid was uh, thrown into with this federal case, um, you know, a whole bunch of disability organisations hit the streets from when that federal court action was going to be uh, announced. But, but generally, um, you know, you're right. Just being noisy doesn't help, mm. but you need to be noisy sometimes. So evidence-based research. So I'm a university person. Uh, I'm a researcher. I've done a you know, few hundred papers and projects where we provide the evidence. And we right. provide the evidence through, uh, you know, getting the collective voice rather than just hearing individuals. You can't go to Treasury um, in, you can't go to Treasury and say, we want X done if you don't have the evidence. And mm -hmm. the evidence requires research. And a lot of the time, disability bodies are well behind the eight ball with things like the building codes, um, simply because the big end of town has a lot of money to throw against us. Yep. Um, and so, um, you know, we need to be able to assemble that evidence. Uh, we need mechanisms to do it. And we're very lucky in a country like Australia um, where, you know, 1992, the Disability Discrimination Act um, came into play. Um, I sent you guys a small article that's got a picture of me receiving my master's degree. Yeah, um, actually, Michael, yeah, Michael Kirby giving that to me. But on that day, I received my... Uh, I received my degree not on the stage. I received my degree on the floor of the um, uh, of the floor of the uh, hall that we we're in at Macquarie University, because the stage wasn't accessible. Now, can I that add to that? Year, can I can I add to that? What year was that? That that, to that was that was 1992. So but that guess the, what happened to me? had only just come in. 92. Guess what happened to me? 2016. Got my uni degree. It was a good university. I liked them. Melbourne University. Guess what happened to me? They had Same to walk thing. off stage and give it to me. What's that? That's 20 odd years later, still going on. 14. Yeah, well, it was... Uh, 2016 uh, and 92. There's oh, a, a yeah. great yeah. Graham Innes uh, only a few years ago at um, uh, Sydney University uh, where he was asked to go and talk about something. Uh, you know, he used his uh, position to 
not take the stage because the stage wasn't accessible for all. Um, oh. And, you know, these are things, you know, that one was set in precedence um, back in about 80, uh, sorry, back in about 96. So there's been court procedures around those things known for a long time. Uh, but of course, the legislation doesn't require retrofitting, but you would expect that a university, and I must say my own university, UTS, it took us you know, a good 10 years to get the stage done. And that wasn't because there weren't good people inside. There was a person that was uh, in a reasonably senior position that didn't think it was aesthetically pleasing. Ooh. You know, can you believe that? Yeah. And now everybody, uh, and please, next time you're up in Sydney, come and I'll show you an amazing uh, set up for, um, you know, staging within a, uh, w within a system that nobody even notices. So who, who gives you know, this is all, but it, it's know. a real signifier of whether you're welcome. And yeah. that's, you know, and the same thing with captioning uh, or with um, tactile ground service indicators or with audible signals on lifts. Yeah. You know, you want to do things to, ma uh, to make people uh, as independent as possible. And, you know, my big kick at the moment is around aspects of um, employment, because there is no doubt um, that more of us live in poverty. We've got such low, so, so much lower employment rates, uh, even though uh, we've got access to um, education and many of us have got good levels of education, but still can't get, you know, inverted commas, the literal foot in the door. Mm. Uh, to get that first opportunity. And you asked me before about, you know, not having a disability than having it. From the time I was 14 to 19, I would have done 20 different sorts of jobs. Now, not yeah. full time, but I had all these experiences. You know, I, I, I worked as a worked as a labourer, worked in supermarkets, uh, worked in clubs. Um, and you've got a feel for the sorts of work you like. With people with disability, we don't get those opportunities to try out heaps of stuff. Um, and the whole employment space, and I know you've been involved in some aspects of self-employment. I've, I've just finished a major project on uh, entrepreneurship and that space uh, is very important for people with disability because it ends up being, uh, you know, they get so jack of not getting career development not being respected for their abilities, they go bugger it, I'll go and do that for myself. And they do so at rates that are 40% higher than the non-disabled population. Even though self-employment is risky, and mm -hmm. when I mean risky, it's all on you. Um, and a lot of the self-employment entrepreneurial programs, the mainstream ones don't even mention access. So you've got a double paradox. We're not employed enough, but when we want to be self-employed, the programs that give us the education for self-employment and setting up your own business aren't inclusive either. Yeah. I think I might go self-employment for this podcast, actually. <laughs> just cutting us out. What do you reckon, Simon? Very funny. <laughs> I um, Just quickly, just to interrupt, and I'm sure people are thinking the same thing that I am. I can look back on every episode that we've done on Listen Able, and I always take a learning from at least uh, at least one or two learnings from each episode. I reckon I've got six already. Yeah, you're this, switched Simon. on, guys, Simon. It's great to go through this. This historical aspect hasn't been touched on our podcast so far. And it's even great to watch Dylan's reaction as well to hearing some of these stories. The train story about those people in the wheelchair. We had no, both yeah. had no idea. These are amazing. So thank you so much for um, passing on your wisdom. And one thing, I, I, uh, it might be hard to answer and you, and you might not have an answer for it, but I wonder if you could uh, think, what do you wish you had um, that is currently available back in 1983. So let's just say technology all existed. Yeah, or the most, the thing you would like the most. Yeah, like you look at the current technologies of what exists. If you could go back to 1983, what do you, one thing do you wish you had accessibility to? And then the other side of that is looking at um, this generation, the latest generation, maybe more technologically savvy social media generation. Uh, what are you glad that you don't? Well, well look, I'll, I'll do... I'll do a personal one, then I'll do a collective one. Sure. For, yep. Definitely from a personal perspective, speech recognition, um, computing. Yep. So uh, just having speech recognition and even the iPhone uh, is driven by um, Dragon technology, Dragon naturally speaking technology. 
Um, when I needed to do a lot of text work, as you know, not surprising, um, you know, once you're in a university system, you're driven by uh, everybody sort of publish or perish and getting work done. I'm I can be more productive than the uh, average academic on words per day with my speech rec system. So speech recognition, you know, I I don't have fine motor control. Um, I don't have full use of my arms. Uh, but with uh, you know the system I've got sitting here in the office, uh, I can be as productive as the next person intellectually. I've got to work hard because I'm. I don't regard myself as a particularly brilliant people. I've met many brilliant people in the university system, and I you know, just admire their uh, intellects. But yeah, that that speech where I can be able to get it out there, and of, and of course, similar things for people who are blind, like you know, jaws screen readers that read out what's uh, on the net uh, if the uh, if the web pages are constructed in a particular way. Old text, um, everybody. We love yeah. that. Yep, uh, and. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously uh, we're we're seeing audio description now more on TV, uh, and also captioning for uh, people who are deaf or hearing impaired. I actually find that you know, and I, I I'm a, I suppose I'm an educator first and foremost. Um, I've I've tried some uh, I've tried some of that live captioning that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually really good for all students, whether yeah, exactly. uh, because what it does. Um, learn you know some people are visual learners um others get uh extra learning through actually writing stuff down um others uh it's diagrammatic others it's reading text but most of us take a little bit of each of those and so um having those words come up on screen you know helps all sorts of people um not just uh somebody that's deaf or hearing impaired so that that tech definitely I did a I, I did a um, show with Ellen Fanning a few um, uh, a year or two ago around the Cyber Olympics in Switzerland, and what I would say is, while everybody wants to make uh, Crips walk again, if you actually ask um, people, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go spinal cord injury first. If you ask people with spinal cord injury what the priorities would be i think it goes something like uh you know bladder bowel sexual function yep, getting right. hand manipulation um and then yeah it'd be nice if we could walk um <laughs> because it's that other stuff that nobody wants to talk about that can really be a downer um for um being in control of your life mm -hmm. uh and being independent in a lot of other ways. I think it, yeah, also, so interesting. also a lot of people, I agree, they'd be like, what would you rather do? Be able to walk? Like, I'd love to be able to go to the pub without steps. Like they think like, it's an easier thing than mm. actually you think, but everyone has an assumption that's what we want. And also when people first have an accident, a lot of them pay 75 grand a year to go to America, to go to a walking camp and they get back every after a year and they go, that was a waste of money. I wish I just used that money bendering around America, whatever it is. Mm. You know what I mean? Oh, I'll, I'll look, uh, you know, I've, I've done some of the neuro moves programs over the last few years to keep fit. And, um, you know, we, we might have time just to say one or two things about the NDIS as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I actually found it quite liberating doing that stuff. But, you know, going back, 30, you know, 37 years ago, I went into a program uh, that was, you know, supposedly, um, you know, offered many opportunities in the day for improved spinal function coming out of program. It was um, being, um, uh, was through hyperbaric chambers mm -hmm. and using, you know, oxygen uh, to uh, improve the outcomes uh, of injury. Now, I've heard, I don't know how many stories of hope I've heard over the years, but you can't put your life on hold. Uh, you got to start living your life. And if the cure stuff comes along and there's a program at my university, there's a program at Griffith U University that look, you know, very interesting and promising. Um, but I read a lot of clinical research stuff. Um, if it comes, it comes. But 
don't put your life on hold. Mm. There's still so much cool stuff to do when you get out and about in the community. And I've mentioned, you know, employment a few times now. Um, you know, I wouldn't have met my wife if I uh, wasn't employed. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't have had as many good friends if I wasn't out and about more often. Um, and they take small steps after a traumatic injury. And so, um, you know, I, you know, I'd always volunteered. I never thought of about it as that way as a, you know, a coach, surf lifesaver and all those sorts of things. But I, you know, volunteered in these um, disability advocacy organisations. And it was a tremendous step in getting a whole lot of soft skills on top of the education I was doing. But more importantly, it expanded my network. And if we were talking, um, you know, from an academic point of view, that's all called uh, yeah, human capital is about your skill development, but social capital is about your networks. Um, and the wider your networks are, the more opportunities you're going to get. And, you know, Dylan through sports showing that, but I knew as somebody you know, six foot three and I, I was only ever going to be a point fiver in uh, Murderball back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, my, uh, I would have to put my efforts um, into other areas to be, you know, excellent at what I do, um, and that opened up all sorts of things. Um, so yeah, busy living. Um, I like to say we it's we all done. find our little niches. Yeah, mm. yeah, get busy living. Exactly right. I also said to my friend who dropped seventy five grand at one of those places to try and learn how to walk. Do you know how much fun we can have with seventy five grand? I was like, ah. we can still have a lot of fun <laughs> Straight, in a wheelchair together. Straight. Straight to Vegas. Straight to Vegas. <laughs> you, you and me, Professor. Let's go get loose together. No, Vegas is incredibly accessible. It it's an amazing spot. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and you know the t the tables are all pretty accessible, and the oh, really? extra very good entertainment as well. Are you talking about strippers? No, well, I mean, if you need to get a lap dance, you've always got a chair, oh, haven't you? Gosh, oh, come on. Um, <laughs> Now Simon, <laughs> <his> face <laughs> He'd love it. Yeah. Uh, Simon, we do a thing called the Bowl of Uncomfortable. This is where uh, people send us questions, knowing that you're yeah, going yeah, to be yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. Um, may feel, make you feel uncomfortable, but that's how we make people comfortable by having these conversations. Um, this one's this one's okay, I think. Um, not my opinion, yours. What's been your hardest moment of your life with a disability in your thirty-five plus years in a chair? Well, apart from those. First those first months. instances, yeah. Yeah, apart from those first few months. Uh, in those first few months, uh, you know, after getting into a manual chair, being able to sort of push around, you know, having a meeting with a doctor where, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, it was pretty obvious after uh, nine months that I wasn't going to be getting too much more physical improvement. So that was a real earth shatterer at the time because you, you know, the, the, the terrible community attitude, and you hear it all the time with traumatic injury. If you just try and, you know, you just put all your will into it, uh, you'll be able to overcome it. Well, I'm sorry, that's just bullshit. And that really makes a lot of us feel really bad. Um, you know, there are some things that physiologically, uh, medically, you know, they can't cure or overcome. Otherwise, everybody had lived forever. Yeah, people so, say that yeah. to me as well, Simon. They go, yep. have you ever tried walking? I was like, no, I just sat at home lying in bed. Just That's just right. That's right. Bed. So that was one. And then two years, um, 2018, I had my first really bad year medically. Uh, nothing to do with spinal cord injury, um, something that could happen to uh, anyone. And, you know, over a, over a period, oh, one, one part then uh, also, Spinal, but you know, over a period of year, I, I spent you know three months in hospital, and I thought it was all spiraling out of control, um, and it just gets you thinking about what's, you know, what what are the important things of life, and uh, you know, making time for family, friends, appreciating the things you've got, and um, you know, really planning to do some really cool stuff when you got out. So I had a cracker of a year last year and you know got got over to uh i mean been overseas quite a lot but never been to london and was able to coincide with the day at the you know fifth test and 
Beautiful. Uh, see some family and friends over there, but also really importantly for me, work-wise, caught up with people there and also caught up with people in uh, Spain where one of the big sport management conferences was and uh, have these projects that are you know running into the future now. And that's also really important for all people to say, set yourself some goals and, um, you know, tick off what you can with those goals. And we all don't, you know, we're, we're all not successful everything we do. Um, and then just pick yourself up and have a crack at something else because um, I'm, I, I suppose I'm a, you know, I'm, I suppose I'm a cross between an atheist and an agnostic. Um, I haven't Me seen too. too many bright lights. I've seen a lot of dark tunnels in the few times I've flatlined. <laughs> um, and you've got to enjoy yourself while you can. Mate, that's a beautiful sentiment. Before we let you go as well, you know, broad question, which we'll try and narrow it down into a simple answer. You're an expert in your field. You're a king of inclusion and diversity. In five years, what do you want to see the disabled community? Where where do you want it to head? Because I, want, I know actually, it's I don't want to. I'm the the disabled community has to talk more than non-disabled community. And what I really want to see is a lot um a, you know real change in attitude uh coming from our leaders uh in other areas of the community mm -hmm. so I, i'd love to see um people understanding that most people with disabilities want a fair go and if they take their uh take whatever baggage they've got and put it away somewhere and if somebody with a disability wanders into their office, see it as an opportunity, not as an awkward situation to get out of um, and engage. And what they'll find is uh, that, you know, people are people. Now we're starting to see that with some really cool documentaries um, that are breaking things on TV. I, I think there's some problems with um, some of those around that, you know, um, a little bit like, you know, Paralympians still in a held up as super crips a lot of the time. Agreed. Uh, but they're not super crips. They're just no. like everybody else when they go back into community. Correct. So sometimes those shows really show the, you know, the best of the best in uh, whatever the area is. And you've seen that with some of the autism programs around employment or around love. I mean, it's all very nice. But for people to treat, others like they'd see themselves treated and i know it's a, a cliche but disability is going to touch everybody's life there's an extraordinary correlation between rates of disability and as people get older um, so if for nothing else uh you know uh, look at disability in a different way do as much as you can to be inclusive in whatever area it is that you're engaged with disability because it's likely that you're going to get some assistance from that as you get older or some of your family members will be in those positions as well. So help yourself and help everybody else. I love that. Yeah. Because you never know when your mom or your dad's going to get MND, yeah. something's going to happen. It affects everybody in some, or your kid or whatever it is. Yeah. It's interesting. Like everyone who listens to our podcast, I think is an ally of the disability community. Hence they're interested in what we're talking about and, and the community is itself. Um, but I think, yeah, somebody, some people need to be struck by it in their own personal lives, you know, directly or indirectly for it to really affect them and realize how lack of accessibility there is and to get angry, which is unfortunate because, you know, hey. hopefully a generation well, that, will change. And, Whatever and, gets and it that, done. <laughs> and that's the thing that the you know, research shows that if you've had an interaction with a person with a disability, you're more likely to be uh, empathetic towards mm -hmm. Um, understanding and being more open. So, um, you know, everybody that's listening that is from the uh, uh, yeah, non-disabled community, talk to others, uh, get others enthusiastic. And certainly, you know, I've been really lucky to meet um, so many really cool organisations. And I will give a plug here. Uh, I'll give a plug to the Opera House and all the work that uh, the CEO and also Jenny Spinnick's done there. The Opera House was one of the most hostile oh, yeah. organizations towards disability. Uh, they were elitist. They uh, you know, believed that 
uh, heritage was um, all conquering. And that organization has changed into one of the most um, inclusive and understanding organizations towards disability in a 10 year period um, that's exemplary. So it doesn't take much uh, when you've got good people at the top and the bottom of an organization working together to not only make it good for customers, but what we also see is when you get people in your organization as employees, then disability just becomes part of the everyday. Love it. Yeah. Uh, Professor Simon Darcy, uh, uh, thank you so much for coming on. A big thank you to Renee once again for nominating you. Um, it's been it, not an eye opener. It's been a, an awakening and it's also been a great learning over the last hour. So thank you so much for your time. Also, if you want to find out some more about uh, professors, articles and things like that, I was on your Twitter before. There's a there's a few links there where people can read up about some of the stuff that you research and study. I'm going to be stealing some of your stats. Is that all right, brother? Can I have some? Uh, uh, as long as you acknowledge, yeah, I'm buddy, happy. I will. <laughs> yeah, I won't claim it was my own. Don't worry about that. Thank you. Uh, no, we got we we got heaps of that stuff, and so thanks a lot, Dylan Angus, for uh, the opportunity. And uh, we're off. Uh, tonight for a celebratory uh, dinner for the 22nd anniversary. Love to Fiona when she listens to this. <laughs> Good on you, I mate. probably yeah. heard the sound of my voice too much. See you later, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Professor. Thank you.